All right. Welcome to the annual Author and Artist Celebration. Thank you for joining us. Today, we recognize the published works and significant works of art uh, during the 2020 to 2021 calendar years. Even through a global pandemic, the diverse scholarly output of our SJSU faculty and staff continues to amaze me. To kick off the event, and sorry, Justin, can we get the next slide, please? By the way, I should have introduced myself. Sorry, I skipped that part. Uh, my name is Michael Meth, and I'm the Dean of the SJSU King Library. And Justin, now over to the next slide, please. Thank you. To kick off the event, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items with you. Uh, for one, uh, the event is live captioned, so you are able to uh, turn it on if you'd like. Um, you'll see on the bottom of the screen, there should be on your Zoom window, a live transcript button, and you uh, can follow along that way. We're also recording the event, and so uh, you are welcome to share the celebration with your friends, family, and colleagues at a future time. Please also remember to mute your mics during this presentation. Um, thank you, there we go, back to this one. Please also remember to mute your mics during the presentations. Um, if you'd like to comment or celebrate our honorees, we welcome you to drop your congratulatory, congratulatory remarks in the chat, similar to what you're seeing in that GIF on the site. Before we start the program any further and proceed, I would like to uh, ask you to join me in giving your attention to our land acknowledgement. Uh, and you will see in a second a recording that was prepared by the Native American Student Organization. So here we go. While we gather at San Jose State University, we are gathered on the ethno-historic tribal territory of Tiatmen Ohlone, who were direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in the Moekma Ohlone tribe and who were missionized into Mission Santa Clara, San Jose, and Dolores. The lands on which San Jose State University is established and continues to be of significance to the Moek Maloni tribe. We also recognize that the ancestors of the Moek Maloni constructed and maintained the three Bay Area missions. Hello. Our campus extends to surrounding areas that held Tupentaca Roadhouse, which were once located at the historic Lope Nigo Nangrant. Rancho Pozolomi, Pozo, Pozolmi, y Positas de las Animas, Little Wells of Souls, and also Marcelo, Pio, and Cristobal's land grant, Rancho Ulistac, which were places of celebration and religious ceremonies, as well as nearby ancestral heritage shell mounds that served as the tribe's traditional cemetery sites and territorial monuments. San Jose State University also desires to honor the military service of the Moekma men and women who have honorably served overseas during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraq, and who are still serving in the United Armed Forces today. Thank you. All right, thank you. And with that, I would like to turn over the program to interim president, Steve Perez. Steve. Thank you, Michael. Um, and, and through the uh, amazingness of Zoom, I'm still able to join this, although I'm home uh, feeling very, very sick. And so uh, I'm really excited to be here, uh, but my voice might be a little bit quiet and I may not make it to the end of the event. Uh, but it's great to be here this afternoon. I wanna start off by thanking the Office of the Provost, the University Library, and our Office of Research and Innovation. I know how hard it can be to put together an event of this magnitude. And I know that the challenge was even greater than usual since we're honoring two years worth of submissions. Your teamwork in pulling all of this off also exemplifies the kind of multidisciplinary collaboration that I'm learning is a real hallmark of this university. So thank you all very much for your efforts to ensure our authors and artists are recognized to the degree they deserve. It's greatly appreciated. As a relative newcomer to San Jose State and as a former provost who's worked with a lot of faculty members over the years, I can't tell you how happy I am to be a part of this event and to help recognize and acknowledge the amazing output of research, scholarly and creative activity uh, that we're going to learn about today. I had a chance to look over the list of honorees these past two years and the breadth and depth of those we're recognizing is truly staggering. I'm an economist by academic training, but I have a strong appreciation, maybe even a strong envy for the kinds of works that so many of you have created or published. Whether it's in the realm of nonfiction, current events, politics, history, or another genre, it's just really impressive what you've been able to do. And the diversity, the variety of subject matters on display, and the number of San Jose State Colleges represented 
with these works is breathtaking. I can hardly believe the list of award winners represents just two years of creative and artistic output. Finally, I just wanted to add how great it is that this university has made such a strong commitment to its research, scholarship, and creative activity. I'm sure the investments that have been made to expand our Ariska support infrastructure and make all of our endeavors as successful as possible are making a difference and paying dividends in ways that will benefit society. Congratulations again to all of our honored artists and authors. We so admire and appreciate the passion, dedication, and creativity you have demonstrated in your works. As I said, I'm very excited to be here today and see what you all have produced. It is just the tip of the iceberg of what we do here at San Jose State. And we're so proud to be a part of this university and to be associated with you all. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Michael to continue with today's program. Michael. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for joining us. And I hope you get better soon. Um, and thank you for these opening remarks. Thank you very much. And with that said, uh, I would like to introduce Nick Sidlowski, our scholarly communications and digital scholarship librarian at the University Library. Nick, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and happy National Library Workers Day. I want to begin by congratulating all of the faculty, authors, and artists whose work we're celebrating today. If you get a chance to browse the collections of books and other publications from 2020 and 2021, you'll find an incredible diversity of topics and of scholarly and artistic approaches. At the King Library, we strive to help all SJSU faculty to achieve their scholarly communication goals and to help make sure their work has the greatest possible impact within their field. Every academic and artistic discipline has its own culture and practices, and our goal is to provide services that reflect that. So while my main job this afternoon is to give you a very brief introduction to the library's scholarly communication services, I want to make sure our faculty members know that those services are constantly evolving and that if you have a new idea or project that the library might be able to help you with, we would always be excited to hear from you. When I say scholarly communication services, what I mean is the help the library can offer you in navigating the publication process. This includes consultation. There are librarians who can help you with copyright questions, with questions about research impact metrics like H index or impact factor, or with questions about data management plans and processes. Going beyond consultation, the library can help you share, promote, and archive your published work through SJSU ScholarWorks. SJSU ScholarWorks is SJSU's institutional repository, where we share faculty scholarship, publish peer-reviewed journals and electronic theses and dissertations, and present collections that document SJSU's past and present, all in order to provide the broadest possible access to the rich intellectual output of the SJSU community. Each year, people from over 200 countries download over 1.3 million items from SJSU ScholarWorks. It has a real impact in increasing access and exposure for SJSU ScholarWorks. But I think for SJSU faculty, we hope that the best thing about ScholarWorks might be how easy it is to participate. Just send a photo and a current CV to scholarworks at sjsu.edu and the library staff will create a faculty profile listing your work from the past five years. We'll also check the policies of your publishers and whenever possible, we'll add your articles and other scholarship to the SJSU ScholarWorks collection, making them easy to find on search engines and Google Scholar and free to download for anyone in the world. ScholarWorks is also where we've brought together the books and other works that we're celebrating today. I hope you all get a chance to browse through the collection that Erica Johnson, the King Library's Institutional Repository and Digital Scholarship Coordinator has created for this event, and the collections for past author and artist celebrations, which stretch all the way back to 2010. SJSU ScholarWorks is part of the King Library's commitment to an open access future for scholarly communication. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic presents a dramatic example of the potential impact of opening access to scholarship. In 2020, when the biggest for-profit academic publishers made research on the pandemic immediately and freely available, they allowed global research into public health interventions, vaccines, and treatment to proceed at the fastest possible pace. But there are many pressing issues and so much valuable work that faculty authors want to share with the world. We really can't afford to reserve open access for global pandemics. 
For that reason, the King Library is pursuing multiple strategies to advance open access. For example, the library's Associate Dean for Research and Scholarship, Emily Chan, was part of the team that negotiated the current pilot agreement between the CSU and Elsevier, allowing CSU authors to publish open access articles in Elsevier journals without incurring article processing char charges that would normally apply. These strategies are part of the library's work to navigate a complex scholarly communication environment but a big part of our job at the library is to make that environment as accessible and straightforward for our faculty authors as we possibly can. That's why I always stress that we're here to help and answer any questions you may run into along the way. You can find out more about SJSU ScholarWorks and the library's other efforts to help faculty scholars and promote open access at the page linked on the slides. I'll also paste the link in the chat. Thank you all for attending this wonderful event and congratulations once again to all the inspiring faculty authors and artists who we are here to celebrate. And next I'd like to introduce Richard Makarski, Associate Vice President for Research. Thank you, Nick. Um, I wanna take this opportunity to thank the library and Dean Michael Meth for hosting this important event. I also would like to thank Mariah Ramsauer, Leslie Seacrest, and Anina Wise Lochner for spearheading the development of this event and for putting on such a great show. It's only fitting that the library host the annual author and artist celebration, not only because the physical space of libraries is where we hold these remarkable works to further the knowledge commons, but also because the library and the tools it offers are instrumental to the production of these works. As part of the Division of Research and Innovation with a background as a scholar, I want to underscore the remarkable accomplishments of our honorees. Producing a book or a significant work of art is a monumental achievement that requires both attention to detail and a wider worldview. Balancing between the requirements of the particular component of a work, be it a sentence, a page, a chapter, or one piece of a larger canvas is in and of itself a challenge. This is the challenge that we often associate with Riska the sharp focus that uncovers connections between the seemingly unrelated, highlighting for the audience the ways in which the particular foci of study are important. This detailed work is often why we celebrate, what we celebrate about RISCA, and it's what can separate the work done in the academy from much of what takes place in other industries. Today, we celebrate those who have done this detailed work and then have also been able to create a larger narrative connecting the details and triumphs of perseverance to create holes that are more than the sum of their parts. In short, our honorees and their work represent the best of the academy and the promise it provides as a pillar of society, a pillar that helps to shape a better world through the interpretation of our world through RISCA. These works of arts and books are offered to members of society so that those who engage with them may better understand the world, their place in it, and their influence on it. Really, these honorees help us to better see ourselves and therefore help us to better ourselves. Thank you for joining us in, in the celebration of their work and their remarkable accomplishments. I want to once again congratulate each and every one of our honorees on their work and the importance of their efforts and their and presence to making SJSU a vibrant university and the knowledge commons. During the next portion of our program, we'll be introduce each college dean and they will show one honorees video submission that will feature a short description of their work. These featured videos were selected by the organizing committee. All video submissions are featured on the website and ScholarWorks, and we appreciate all honorees for the wonderful videos. Afterward, the dean will congratulate all honorees by naming by name in their college and then introduce the next dean. With that, I'll introduce Dan Mashavi, Dean of the Lucas College of College and Graduate School of Business. Dan. Thanks, Richard. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, there is just some fantastic scholarship going on inside Lucas College of Business, and I'm delighted today to present the work of one of my colleagues, Elisa Mattarelli, uh, and her work, Collaborative Spaces at Work, Innovation, Creativity, and Relations. Hello, my name is Elisa Mattarelli and I am an Associate Professor at the School of Management in the College of Business. I am the co-editor of the book uh, Collaborative Spaces at Work, Innovation, Creativity, and Relations, together with my colleagues Fabrizio Montanari and Anna Chiara Scapolan from the University of Modena Reggio Emilia in Italy. 
Um, a few years ago, uh, there was a, a strong interest, I would say even an obsession, in designing new spaces for collaboration. Companies, but also public organizations, uh, were and are still interested in creating physical spaces where people could meet uh, formally or informally, have interactions, uh, and generate potentially new and uh, breakthrough ideas. Uh, the hope was that uh, through face-to-face -face interactions, uh, individuals uh, could interact more with others uh, and overall uh, come up uh, with more and better ideas uh, and more innovation. Collaborative spaces take very different forms. Uh, there are collaborative spaces inside of uh, private companies, uh, but there are also a lot of collaborative spaces uh, that are in public contexts, uh, such as innovation labs, uh, uh, social innovation hubs, uh, uh, fab labs, uh, incubator, accelerators, uh, and cultural innovation centers. Uh, and all these are spaces uh, that um, are intended to foster the encounter between people with very different backgrounds. In this book, uh, you will find different chapters uh, uh, that present research on different types of collaborative spaces. This research shows that uh, these spaces face, face multiple challenges uh, and uh, um, the multiple factors need to be taken into account to really foster interactions and get to the innovation and creativity promise. This topic is particularly relevant today as companies and public organizations are rethinking about the role of physical space for regular work and also for knowledge intensive work. And I hope that reading these book chapters and these cases will stimulate some interest about the role of physical space and will give suggestions on how to design better spaces for collaboration and innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Congratulations on your work. College of Business would also like to congratulate, as the siren passes me, College of Business would also like to congratulate uh, two other authors whose works were published in uh, 2020 and 2021. Congratulations to Joyce Osland and Kim Ulick. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Heather Latimer, Dean of the College, Connie L. Lurie College of Education. Great, thank you, Dan. And good afternoon, everyone. It is a delight to be, to be able to be here with all of you. Um, I'm delighted to be able to recognize the work of Dr. Tiffany Marie, Assistant Professor in the Department of Teacher Education. Dr. Marie's documentary, The Children Could Fly, centers the stories of two black children, Tatiana and Isaiah, their families and their supportive educational communities. Their unified stories and experiences push us to think beyond the limitations of schooling towards the necessity and fullness of deep-rooted education for our young people. This film exemplifies the praxis between research, practice, policy, and advocacy to which the Lurie College of Education aspires. Well, the opportunities for our young people to learn in a way that is not harmful are rare. I had like probably like four good teachers from fourth to eighth grade that like actually got me to sit there and like learn and feel comfortable learning. I was really scared because I was hearing all kinds of stories about all these middle schools and I'm thinking, oh, my son might get lost in the shuffle somewhere out there like that. I felt like I was at a straight prison. We have to wear a uniform. We have to stand in a straight line. Even though Kip was in middle school, in elementary school, I didn't feel like he. We had young people who were 14 years old who had the physiological makeup of women who were in their 60s who were breast cancer survivors. And when we talk about schooling, it's important to distinguish it from education. Schooling is a historical process originally intended to strip Africans and other indigenous people from our original ways of being and knowing 
and replace those ways of being and knowing with more passive, docile, obedient, and compliant practices. Kids from Baby Hunters Point and other communities like that need to be need to like travel and go to other places and like focus on other things besides school. I think one of our foundational ideas is that when people know that they're blessings, we know that we're meant to be here for a purpose. And too often, this understanding becomes really distorted in schools, particularly for black children. It's really daunting how much a child can say something and it not be heard by adults. You cannot say that every child is a blessing and still grade them in the same ways that we've been doing for years. You realize when you have children that you're not able to do everything. And it's very important when they say it takes a village to raise a child. When we actually remove the weights and the barriers of schooling, what do we get? We get flying children. We get children who can fly. Congratulations to Dr. Tiffany Marie, and thank you for your work. Thank you for your passion and your commitment, your expertise and your energy in sharing this documentary. And now it is my honor to introduce Dr. Cheryl Ehrman, Dean of the Charles W. Davidson College of Engineering. All right, thanks, Heather. Uh, so like my other colleagues have said, it's great to be here to celebrate the work of our wonderful uh, faculty authors. And today uh, we're going to be uh, uh, spotlighting Ahmed Banafa. He's one of our lecturer faculty in interdisciplinary engineering. Uh, he has a broad range of expertise across uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, cybersecurity, uh, and uh, blockchain. And he's also amazing at distilling um, his expertise and distilling uh, um, relevant uh, circumstances into um, just wording that everybody can understand. And uh, he also loves to write books about these different topics. And so uh, his video is about his work entitled Blockchain Technology and Applications. Hello, everyone. My name is Ahmed Banafa, and I'm a faculty member at the College of Engineering of our wonderful University of San Jose State. Uh, I am really honored to have my book listed in the celebration of the author and artist, uh, the annual uh, celebration we have at San Jose State. And many thanks for everybody in the library for this kind of work and efforts. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my book. Uh, it's part of my uh, research areas, uh, which is the blockchain. A blockchain is the technology that it's used uh, in making all the buzzwords we hear about them these days, the, the Bitcoin, the Ethereum, the NFTs, uh, all of them built on uh, the blockchain technology and uh, more to come. Uh, I wrote the book, you know, uh, during the time of the pandemic and uh, looking at the uh, blockchain technology as one way that will be part of the future and actually it's going to shape the future for so many things. The bottom line here is that everything is decentralized. You'll hear a lot about the Web3. I hear a lot about, you know, the metaverse. All of the, you know, above is uh, related somehow and built somehow on blockchain technology. The book goes through uh, a whole uh, cycle of explaining uh, the concept itself, uh, making sure that you understand it, and then goes through some of the trends of blockchain and uh, um, also the applications of blockchain in different areas uh, and end up with the future of blockchain. Uh, I look at blockchain as, uh, you know, as, as exactly like uh, uh, electricity. Uh, we don't see it, we know about it, we see the impact of the electricity and everything we're doing. And this will be the story of the blockchain. What is coming the, uh, you know, in the, uh, in, in the five to 10 years is, is uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the move of the uh, tech world and also the move of the world uh, towards the decentralization. Bitcoin, Ethereum, cryptocurrencies in general is the one that uh, caught the attention of many people. There are many fields that the blockchain help with like 
the supply chain, an example of that, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, you know, uh, many things that the blockchain will help with it. Uh, just to simplify the process and 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 make sure that uh, I'm talking about something which is clear to everybody. Blockchain is having multiple copies of the same information at thousands of nodes. So if something happened to a few of them, you can just disconnect them and you still have copies. So censorship is not going to work. Uh, at the same time, uh, enabling the peer-to-peer, -peer, which means if I send you the information, whether it's money, information, videos, uh, uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever digital asset that can be done as part of the blockchain. The NFTs, which is a new product of the blockchain, uh, is uh, digitizing everything. But the whole thing about the NFTs is that there is a signature that it is saved in the blockchain. And you're the only one who have that signature. So if somebody tried to copy it and sell it without the signature, they cannot, they cannot get the same price as yours. And, uh, and if somebody bought it from you and sell it, you get uh, you know a portion of that of the proceed so uh the we're still at the beginning of the blockchain uh, revolution there's a lot to come and uh, we're going to see this one in coming years and you're going to see it is will have it is going to have the impact of electricity on many things at the level of uh, you know of the decentralizing everything because most of the problem we have now in cybersecurity and other fields is because all the information is concentrated in one place. If you hack it, you get it in that one, you can change it, you can block it, you can do so many things to that if it's centralized in one place with all the benefits of centralization. So uh, uh, again, thanks to the library for uh, selecting my book and uh, it's an honor to, to have it listed. All right, so congratulations to Ahmed Benafa. The college Engineering uh, is also honoring four other faculty members who have published works in uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, so congratulations also to Akdem Almanasir, uh, Vishnu Pindaliala, uh, Chandrasek Chandrasekhar Vopalapati, and Abbas Mualam. So congratulations, engineering. And next, I would like to introduce Audrey Shillington, who is Dean of the College of Health and Human Sciences. Hi, thank you, Cheryl. Well, as everyone has said, this is a, a deep honor for me to be able to be part of such an amazing event and what a unique opportunity to celebrate these uh, rich and impactful works that we're hearing about. Uh, many great things are happening in the College of Health and Human Sciences and the video that we're gonna be watching is spotlighting Joan Steidegger's work um, out of kinesiology. Her book is entitled Stand Up and Shout Out, Women's Fight for Equal Pay, Equal Rights, and Equal Opportunities in Sports. The passage of Title IX happened in 1972, decades ago. In fact, I was in elementary school when it passed. Um, and yet today women still struggle in three crucial areas in sports, leadership, money, and media. I would argue that they struggle in those areas um, across the board. So please join me in watching the next video. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Joan Steidinger. I'm a sports and clinical psychologist and happily an adjunct faculty teaching sports psychology in the kinesiology department. I also have a private practice and I write about women inequality in sports, which is a huge topic and has been for years. Um, this is my second book, uh, Stand Up and Shout Out, Women's Fight for Equal Pay, Equal Rights, and Equal Opportunities in Sports. And it's a very important book because it really talks about how we have progr progressed since Title IX and how we haven't. And Title IX, for those of you who may or may not know, was to give women and girls equal facilities in educational institutions with federal funding. They um, didn't realize that it would most impact sports. And since then, girls' participation in sports have increased from 300,000 back then to no, no, to over 3 million to, 
as we talk today. It's a sport. It's a book that was really true to my heart because I've been a lifelong athlete, uh, passionate about sports psychology, and I was fortunate to have interviewed leading women in sports, not only in the United States but throughout the the world. So this book um, is meant to really address the whole issue of the inequality. Um, and we've made a lot of progress in terms of participation, but we've also gone backwards in terms of coaching. Women coaches now coach 41 to 43% of women's teams. Prior to Title IX, they coached 93% of women's teams. Um, this book really tries to shine a light on the inequities in a number of areas, including leadership, media, pay, as I mentioned, coaches, LGP, LGBTQ issues, and many more. At the end of each chapter, I include action steps for people to take to support women's sports and help us move more towards equality. Um, lately, the soccer women purportedly are going to be getting equal pay to the soccer men of the U.S. national teams. Um, I'm waiting for them to rectify their contract negotiations to see if this becomes true. They did give them $24 million in back pay, so that's progress. But let's see if they come out and are equal. Uh, there are heroic women throughout fighting for equality. And act heroic women, actually, and men, too, fighting for women's equality in sports. Uh, and this book really gives you a roadmap for change. It really... Um, tells you and tries to inspire you with stories and action steps, as I mentioned previously. And it's really that celebration of women leading the charge and a call to truly fulfill the promise of Title IX. I want to thank you so much for honoring my book and giving uh, the book an opportunity to be heard about and seen. And hopefully some of you might choose to read it. So thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. So thank you, Joan, for writing this important work and the lifetime commitment to addressing inequities. The College of Health and Human Sciences is also honoring one other faculty member who published a work in 2020 to 2021. So I'd like to do a shout out and congratulations to Susie Ross. Now I would like to introduce Shannon Miller, Dean of the College of Health and Human, or I'm sorry, College of Humanities and Arts. <laughs> Thank you so much, Audrey. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here this afternoon uh, to highlight uh, the work of Katherine Harris, um, as well as a number of other uh, pu publications and works of art in our college. But let me start by introducing this, this video. Professor Katherine Harris is in the Department of English and Comparative Literature, and she is also the Director of Public Programming in the College of Humanities and Arts. Her collection, Digital Pedagogy in the Humanities, Concepts, Models, and Experiments, is innovative not only in its contribution to digital pedagogy, and the many concepts it explores, but also in its format, an open access curated collection of models for teachers and scholars alike. This is a fantastic, flexible, wide ranging and highly accessible contribution to the broad and growing field of ped pedagogy, ped uh, digital pedagogy. Congratulations, Kathy. Welcome. We're excited to present on digital pedagogy in the humanities which has recently been published on the Humanities Commons by the Modern Language Association. Digital Pedagogy in the Humanities is a highly collaborative project almost a decade in the making, and yet it's one that's perfectly fit for the pandemic moment in which we find ourselves. It gives us the opportunity to think not just about teaching online, but teaching online with creativity and purpose. 
Digital Pedagogy in the Humanities is focused around 59 keywords of digital pedagogy, ranging from queer to open to rhetoric to fiction to intersectionality and more. For each keyword, a curator has chosen and annotated 10 pedagogical artifacts, has written a curator statement, and has provided additional resources. The project has four general co-editors, 84 curators, and it contains 59 keywords and over 590 annotated artifacts. These artifacts don't just define digital pedagogy, they present the stuff of teaching and learning, the actual materials, syllabi, assignments, rubrics, and resources, and more. The project is peer reviewed and published through an open process. Material was shared on GitHub, reviewed openly on the Humanities Commons, and because of that open process, the materials were being cited even before the project was officially published. As an example of what you'll find in the collection, let's take a tour through the keyword indigenous. For this particular keyword, curators provided digital resources from the indigenous community as well as student work. The keyword indigenous situates the discussion in the scholarly community to set up the artifacts as beginning, quote, from the idea that cyberspace and the digital are not Western phenomena, end quote. This creates space for decolonizing curriculum and creating anti-racist pedagogies. Let's take a look at an example. The curators explain that, quote, the video AIO Stomp by Skookum Sound Systems can be read as a sonic map illuminating the time and space collapse mobilized through the remix. The curators add that, quote, this assignment allows students to practice in their own ways, creative intimacies with the spatial scales of land, bodies and territories, water or land and terrestrial or celestial, end quote. Creators of artifacts make something for themselves, a syllabus or perhaps an assignment prompt, which is personal, ephemeral and invisible to a larger community. But DPIH generates a chain of sharing and citation that enables us to really work together as a community of scholars invested in helping each other. The annotations not only describe the artifact, but also explain how you can adapt this to your own practice. Isn't the value of scholarship to make it visible for sharing, remixing, and discussion? We need such open sharing now. Our recent forced migration into digital context means that everyone is dealing with the challenges of digital pedagogy, challenges like this list of objections that we discuss in the introduction to this project. In the past, instructors could avoid challenges by avoiding open online student work. But in doing so, not only do students miss out on opportunities like those described for the keyword indigenous, but instructors also do a disservice to students. As personal, professional, and civic lives increasingly play out in open online contexts, we must teach our students to negotiate the challenges of digital identities and privacy. The digital pedagogy community offers models of how to do this, like this privacy assignment in the keyword hashtag. Students look at privacy statements from various social media platforms and aggregate the information in a shared class spreadsheet, which you see on the screen. This helps them better understand how their own data is used and shared. And it's just one example of how open collaborative communities can provide strategies for instructors to engage in such vital issues. We highlight digital pedagogy in the humanities as a model for open social scholarship because instructors and institutions are having these conversations on campus right now. Conversations about open scholarship, about diversity, equity, and inclusion, about decolonizing the curriculum and how to work on being anti-racist. As we write in the introduction, this is why we need digital pedagogy and why digital pedagogy means open social scholarship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy, for introducing this amazing work. Uh, I just want to say that I knew about this uh, through MLA in 2000, 2012, two years before I even arrived at San Jose State. And it was an incredibly exciting project that I'm delighted to see having come to such fruition uh, and such a generous and helpful work uh, to support those in digital pedagogy. 
In addition to Professor Harris's work, the College of Humanities and Arts is honoring 18 other faculty members who have published works of scholarship or significant works of art in 2020 and 2021. Congratulations to Mel Day, Lynn Dow, Rhonda Holberton, Nicola West, Yun Chung Han, Virginia Sanfratella, Johnny Dam, Allison Johnson, Keenan Norris, Andrea Beckert, Kirsten Brandt, Amy Glazier, Shannon Rose Riley, Tiffany Berry, Erica Berman, Christopher Luna Mega, Bo Mu, and Carlos Alberto Sanchez. It is a genuine honor to be able to congratulate the many colleagues in our college who have produced so many in such a wide ranging group of works. Next, I'm delighted to introduce Ruth Heward, Dean of the College of Professional and Global Education. Thank you, Shannon. And what a wonderful celebration to be a part of. Our college spot, so spotlights the Handbook of Archival Practice, where Professor Pat Franks from the School of Information allows us to have an insider view of modern day archivists. Contributors to the handbook give us both local and global perspectives on how current technologies and trends, such as cybersecurity, digital computing, blockchain, there's that word again, social media, and archival activism are interwoven in the practice and profession of archivists. Hello. I'm Dr. Pat Franks, SJSU Professor Emerita. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the SJSU Annual Author and Artist Celebration this year. Unlike earlier theoretical books that explain how the archivist should practice their art, the Handbook of Archival Practice provides a glimpse into the world of the practicing archivist, describing how that theory is actually put into practice. The handbook is comprised of 10 sections. The first, the prevailing environment, sets the stage for the remainder of the book. Terms describing activities central to the archival process, such as appraisal, acquisition, access, and preservation are included. In addition, responsibilities traditionally considered outside the purview of the archivist, but currently impacting professional activities, such as cybersecurity, digital forensics, cloud computing, and blockchain distributed ledger technologies are also covered. I am so pleased that 17 of the 105 contributors are members of our SJSU community. They include full and part-time faculty, staff, current students, and graduates. These authors contributed essays on topics as diverse as the archival services ethics, grant writing, and dark archives. Archival activism, the first entry in the handbook was written by Carly V. Lowe, the university archivist at San Jose. She shared ideas she has used to promote social change, such as surveying collections as a first step toward acquisition of materials pertaining to communities whose stories are underrepresented in the archives. Carly shared a table of archival work an archivist may undertake to promote inclusion in the archives. One resource she recommends to readers is documenting the now, which has been developing, curating, and distributing a set of strategies to preserve social media content. Craig Simpson, Director of Special Collections and Archives at San Jose, shared his views on event programming which has increasingly become the responsibility of the archivist as they pivot from stewards of records to active facilitators of their collections. Craig provided three very different examples of exhibits in which she has been involved. Orson Welles, a centennial and a symposium. Norman Mineta, the life and legacy of a national leader. And Bay Area Pride, 50 years of LGBTQ, history, politics, and culture. In addition to offering questions to be asked and answered by the archivist planning such events, Craig shared valuable lessons learned and even some unexpected outcomes. 
The archival skills that are outlined in the Academy of Certified Archivists Role Delineation Statement for Professional Archivists align with the entries archivists recommended for the handbook. It's essential that archivists possess all of the skills shown on this slide. But in addition, skills and knowledge from related domains are increasingly of value. For example, business concepts, information management, legal, privacy, and security issues, and emerging and developing technologies. If you only read the books that everyone else is reading, you can only think what everyone else is thinking. This is a profound statement, I think. This book reflects this attitude. Only in our case, the authors with diverse knowledge, education, and experience collaborated on a work to provide a new way of thinking about the responsibilities of the 21st century archivist. A copy of this work has been donated to the library. Additional information can be found at the publisher's website or by contacting me. Again, thank you for your recognition of this publication, The Handbook of Archival Practice. Congratulations once again, Patricia, and thank you for advancing the profession through your book. Now I would like to introduce my colleague, Walt Jacobs, Dean of the College of Social Sciences. Good afternoon, everyone. As the other deans have noted, we are recognizing many, many fabulous artists and authors tonight. For the College of Social Sciences, we'll start with a video about a book published last year. In May, I published a co-edited anthology with Assistant Professor Wendy Thompson of African-American Studies and Assistant Professor Amy August of Sociology and Interdisciplinary Social Sciences. Later that month, Wendy and I were on a panel about the book, along with two of the contributors. The following three minute segment of the hour long conversation provides context about Sparked, George Floyd, racism, and the progressive illusion. Let's watch the video. Let's start with a brief recap of the genesis of the book. The book originated in a conversation I had with Wendy shortly after George Floyd's murder. We both live in California now, but spent many years in Minnesota. After we discussed how race shaped our experiences in Minnesota, I decided to invite other academics who had lived in Minnesota, but now reside elsewhere to reflect on their racialized experiences while they were in Minnesota. From June 8th, 2020 to August 31, 2020, we published an introduction and 21 essays on the social sciences website, the Society Pages. Those essays were from a wide range of authors. In October of 2020, I worked with the editors of the Society Pages to turn the essays into a book. The Minnesota Historical Society Press was interested, but wanted to feature essays by academics of color currently living in Minnesota, especially Black professors. I recruited Wendy and Amy August to be co-editors of the book. We chose 12 of the original essays to reprint and invited new authors to contribute to the anthology. 24 folks said yes. So the book has 36 chapters, plus a preface, introduction, conclusion, and discussion guide. Our goal was to get the book out just before the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. It was officially released yesterday. Let's start off by watching a video interview of one of the book contributors. Jason Marquiso. My essay is Woop Woop, that's the sound of the beast. When I came here in 97, I thought it was the place of milk and honey. You know, compared to what we was dealing with the war on drugs in Chicago, it felt right. I got fooled by Minnesota nights. It's just all a facade, because when it's time to write up that paperwork for a loan, or it's time for me to like, really advance my situation and my family, that's when you're really not so nice. The true story of the police is, man, when we hear those sirens, when we hear them coming, we know it's nothing good for us. Even if somebody around us has called, still can end up being your last day on this earth. When people were talking about Philando being pulled over 54 times, I'm like, man, I probably had that amount in 98 alone. I don't know a life without police harassment. I never, I never experienced that kind of life. We shouldn't pay people to actually harm us. Like, it's rooted in anti-blackness. It's rooted in slave patrol. 
So I never know if I'm gonna get lynched like George Floyd. So there's a ton of parallels. He kept saying, I'm a nice guy. I've said that to the police plenty of time. I'm a genuinely nice person. I walk my path. I love my mom. I do, I do good by the people around me. I was good as president of NAACP. George Floyd was telling him, hey man, I'm not a bad guy. So in my article, I'm saying, we can have safety without law enforcement. It's time to seek alternate forms of justice because the only form of justice for George Floyd would be for him to be reincarnated and have, you know, the rest of his life. And that can't happen. So we need truth. Okay, it looks like that's the, the end of the video. Got to cut off a, a bit abruptly there. But uh, congratulations to Wendy Thompson and Amy August. College of Social Sciences is honoring 14 other faculty members who have published works in 2020 and 2021. Congratulations to Travis Boyce, Akila carter Francique, Roberto Gonzalez, Marco Minichetti, Charlotte Sinceri, Elizabeth Weiss, Deanna Fassett, Kathleen McConnell, Andrew Wood, Matthew Holian, Libra Hildy, Robert Ovitz, Natalie Boero, and Daniel Brooke. Congratulations and thank you for your outstanding contributions. Next, I would like to introduce Mike Meth, Dean of the University Library. All right, thanks Walt, and thank you everybody else who's spoken thus far. I have the pleasure of introducing uh, and work by Christina Munet, Associate Dean for Innovation and Research Management. Her work is entitled Library Supporting Online Learning, Practical Strategies and Best Practices. Uh, this is a book that came about over the last few years where Christina has gathered information and experience in how libraries do this kind of work. Uh, clearly, as we have all experienced over the last two years, this work has even become more relevant since we were forced to go online. So next up, you'll hear from Christina about her work and here we go. Thank you to the organizers of the Author and Artist Celebration for providing this opportunity to share my work with SJSU. I started Library Supporting Online Learning, Practical Strategies and Best Practices in 2018, when Libraries Unlimited asked me to expand on an article I'd written about libraries supporting non-traditional modalities, such as fully online degrees and programs, micro-credentialing, nano degrees, and at that time, MOOCs. Thinking about this book, I immediately wanted it to be a practical guide with tools, resources, and ready-to-use lessons that library educators could deploy in their online and hybrid instructional efforts. And by that, I mean all ways libraries encounter learners, including structured class sessions, reference interactions, and the presentation of asynchronous tutorials and online guides. I drew on my own experience in academic technologies, teaching online instructional design within learning management systems, and my experience as an online learning librarian to help frame the questions the book would answer around how to approach online learning as a unique and distinct experience from an in-person one. I then collected a significant body of research regarding instructional approaches inside and outside the library that had proven positive impacts on online learners specifically. This research generally points to a constructivist approach that emphasizes peer interaction, creating community within the online environment, and relating content to the learner's personal goals and activities. With these factors in mind, I developed and gathered numerous examples of practices across library services that address the needs of online learners. Ultimately, this grew into a format in which each lesson plan and tool is presented alongside a case study of re or research, indicating how the practice contributes to the success and retention of online students. Some of these examples include how to incorporate social media and source evaluation, ways to bring student peer review into the information literacy classroom, and adopting preferred communication styles to improve user experience during things like virtual reference. I also tried to be cognizant of the often limited resources available to libraries by creating a directory of no or low cost tools that support digital constructivist approaches from web-based applications for crowdsourced annotations to mobile apps that gamify introductory library sessions through augmented reality scavenger hunts. The hope is that librarians will not only use the digital tools to create and deploy their own instruction, but that they will ask students to create and share content with these tools as well, building the critical thinking and digital literacy skills students need to be successful in their academic and professional endeavors. It just so happens that one of the most significant transformations in education occurred around the same time the book was released, the move to fully online learning for most students due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
For higher education, that change will likely have a lasting effect on our modality landscape and pedagogical approaches. I believe that transformation makes this book both extremely topical, while also more valuable for libraries in the future and for future librarians. All right, and with that, congratulations again to Christina. In addition to Christina's work, we're also uh, at the University Library honoring the work of one more faculty member who published a work in 2020 or 2021, and that would be Anamika Megwalu. So congratulations. This now wraps up the presentation of works. And so with that being said, I just want to very quickly uh, reflect on this event before I hand it over to Dr. Magdalena Barrera uh, for the closing remarks. Uh, overall, uh, I just feel always so inspired when I hear about this, this incredible range of work that is being conducted around the university. Uh, being new to San Jose State University myself, it is really a distinct honor to also help facilitate some of these interactions like we have today. And I love seeing all the comments in the chat. So with that, I would like uh, for you to please, uh, in however you wish, show your appreciation to all of our noted authors and artists for, that uh, presented today, and also that were featured in the uh, website that we created on ScholarWorks. I want to also thank our speakers tonight, uh, the deans and the faculty members who recorded talks. Um, all of these videos and even some more are on our complete on our website that you can access through our ScholarWorks instance. Uh, I'm posting it just now in the chat and you might have seen some other uh, links already posted earlier. Uh, this innovation that we came up with this year uh, was quite exciting uh, as far as I'm concerned because it helps us really hear in the words of the authors, of the creators, of the artists, what the intentions were behind their work. Uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful to our team that facilitated uh, those interactions as well as to all the speakers who did in fact record. Uh, I want to uh, also thank one more group of uh, people in this event, and that is the organizing team for this annual author and artist celebration. Their work is what made this evening celebration run so smoothly and seamlessly. So with that being said, a very big thank you to Nina weiss lochner Leslie Sechrist, Mariah Ramsdor, Erica Johnson, Justin Villania, and the media services team from the library, all of them, and also Richard Mokarski from the VPRI office at SJSU. So thank you to all, and thank you also to the 120 plus folks who attended tonight's event. Before we conclude, I would like to ask Dr. Magdalena Barrera, Vice Provost for Faculty Success to deliver the closing remarks. Maggie, over to you. Hi, thanks for the invitation to speak with you this afternoon. I'm honored to share a closing reflection to this great event. I'd like to begin by expressing my genuine awe of our colleagues who have published books and produced creative works this year. I'm gonna have to ask my boss, Provost Del Casino, for some extra time off to be able to check out all these amazing works. And now there are two reasons why I say that I'm in awe. The first is because I'm in awe of the range of contributions that our colleagues have made and that we've heard about just a glimpse of here this evening. Um, these works are advancing many critical conversations across diverse fields and genres. But I'm also in awe for a second reason. And it's because I know firsthand that engaging in the creative process, whether that's writing, filmmaking, any kind of performance, is really one of the hardest things that we do as scholars, especially because so many of us come out of graduate training that doesn't prepare us to balance working on our RISCA alongside the many demands of teaching and offering our service and leadership to the university. And when you think about it, to engage in the creative process is to enact a particular kind of faith because as a creator, you never know whether the groundbreaking ideas and like these grand visions in your mind are ever gonna really make it out into the outer world as a finished project that other people can engage with. But all the folks we heard from here today persisted nonetheless because they know that engaging in that work matters and that there are audiences out there that need to hear the thing that only you can say in only the way that you can say it. And that is a very powerful and radical act, especially in a time when the world often feels in tremendous disarray, right? Because these creative works are acts that move us to envision better futures. And I wanna to say too, that the creative act is often romanticized as a very lonely endeavor. And while certain parts of the process certainly can be kind of monastic, you definitely need to have community around you. You need colleagues and family to listen to you, talk out your ideas, give you that much needed feedback. You work closely with editors who help you to refine your work. You need support to circulate that work, get it amplified out in the world and so much more. 
And that's what makes a celebration like this so very special. It's a chance to celebrate also the broader communities of support that are so critical throughout the creative process. So on that note, I'd like to also thank everyone behind the scenes who helped to coordinate this event. And finally, to all the honorees, I am so happy to close out my day with you. You make me so proud to be your colleague. San Jose State is a teaching-centered institution, but what makes that teaching so great is that faculty like you are embodying the teacher-scholar ideal day in and day out. So congratulations again on your newest work, and here's to many more. Thanks. Mm -hmm.